greetings from Potashville, Alabama. It is so good, beautiful day today. So good to be coming to you live from Potashville. You see that we got clouds today, plenty of sunshine. God has been so good, so glorious. And I want to wish all you fathers out there happy Father's Day to you. May God richly bless you. You have a heritage. You have a chance to be the example of a godly man before your children to show them how they ought to live and how they ought to behave themselves on a daily basis. Continue to set that example. Ask God to help you to set that example in all that you do and all that you say. I'm going to do a little different today. I want to bring you a message. You know, we hear a lot about storms and trials and life and everything that's going on. And it's so often, it's so easy in life sometimes to just associate every storm, every bad thing with the devil. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you sure that what you're going through today, the problems, the trials, the struggles that you're having, is the result of the enemy's attack. Are you absolutely sure that the things that you're facing today? I'm going to let's look at two books today in the Bible, in the Old Testament. The books of Job and the books of Jonah. And it's going to be a lesson that we can learn from these two books, if we would take them to heart. We know well know the story of Job, how he was a righteous man and how he suffered greatly because of all that happened. As a matter of fact, it is a beautiful example uh, of uh, its, uh, of extreme patience in the midst of extreme suffering. As a matter of fact, we're told in James chapter 5, verse 10 and 11, it says, Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in, time, in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, in afflict, a suffering affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them worthy, uh, we count them happy, which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. We all know the story of Job, how in Job 1 and 2 that God had allowed Satan to come and to try Job and it allowed Satan to test Job. As a matter of fact, we read in Job chapter 1, starting with verse, verse 6 through 12, I want to read a couple of chapters here. In Job 1, 6 through 12, it says, Now that there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and it feareth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for not? Hast thou not, or hast not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath and he will cause thee to thy face. Verse 12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. 
only upon himself, put not forth thy hand. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord. And we know in the rest of chapter 1 how it, how it records that Satan went, how he, uh, we, we read of how a whirlwind come and different events happened and destroyed everything that Job had. You know, Job was a very wealthy, very rich man. And because of the whirlwind, because of the devil's moving, Everything that he had was destroyed, was taken away from him. And in the end of chapter, near the end of chapter one, that final messenger came. That the with the message that broke the camel's back, if you will, and said, "It was all your children. You had, you know, Job had ten sons, seven out of ten children, seven sons and three daughters, and he, they were all gathered at one of the sons' houses." Partying. <clears throat> and a message will come to Job and said, While your children were in the house partying, a whirlwind come out and, and destroyed the house, and everyone was killed, and I'm the only one left. We read of how Job in his clothes and how he worshiped the Lord and prayed. Listen to me, when bad things happen, that needs to be our first response begin to worship God. But we read how Job did not even begin to falsely accuse God or anything like that. Now let's read on all in the chapter 2, verses 1 through 6 of Job. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From rent. Cometh thou, and Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant, lo, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man, an upright man, one that feareth God and is good of evil, and still... He holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest mine hand, uh, moveth me against him to destroy him without a cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his for his life. But put forth thy hand now and touch his bones and his flesh, and he will cause thee to thy face. And again, the Lord, and the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand, but save his life. We know that we, we all know the story of how that goes. The Job went to bed, I believe, one night, woke up the next morning covered from head to toe with painful boils, the Bible says. Now, and that he literally had to scrape himself. Not only had Job lost their fame, but was now suffering in intense pain and agony. We've seen that Job's righteousness, and although all these things happened to Job, Job continued to trust the Lord, and, and all that what was going on even though we don't understand what was happening. <coughs> now we learn three things from these, these passages. Number one, there is a head of protection around, a, around the child of God who is living a holy life. Then I'm going to tell you, there is a hedge of protection around the child of God who is in the center of the Lord's will. Psalm 34 verse 7 says, The, uh, the angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him to deliver them. God will take care of his own. He will protect you. There is a protection. But understand, that don't mean bad things can't happen. But I want us to understand, there is a head of protection around us. Uh, number two, Satan must get God's permission before he can do anything to a Christian. 
or to a child of God, and even then he can only go but so far. You see, Satan had to come before the Lord and get his permission, the Lord's permission, before he could even touch Job's possession. Again, he had to get God's permission before he could even touch Job with sickness, with illness, with the board. We must understand and realize if we could ever just grasp that, the devil can only go but so far and realize that, that, that oh, he can only do but so much. Number three, Satan can be the cause of the storms in, in a Christian's life. Now, you know, we as Christians, especially we as Pentecostals, we love to get up doing, we love to get caught up doing what's called spiritual warfare. And, and there is such a thing. When something happens, we won't, when something happens, we don't like, we don't agree with. We immediately start pleading the blood. We immediately start rebuking the devil. We immediately start getting people to pray against the enemy. And don't misunderstand me, we should do these things. But I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a thought-provoking question. Are you absolutely sure that the storm you're going through right now is from the devil. Think about that while I get me a real quick drink of water. Are you absolutely sure that the storm you're facing right now is from the devil? I'm going to let's look at someone else, another prophet, another Old Testament prophet, if you will. Let's look away at the book of Job. I mean, Jonah. Now, we all know the story of Jonah and the whale. Most of us have been to school and healed in, in the school, I mean, in Sunday school, how Jonah was in the belly of the whale. But let me ask you a question. How did Jonah rise up in the belly of the whale? How did Jonah rise up in the belly of the whale? We love the story of Jonah. We, we read it and we think about it, and it's just a small book in the Old Testament, only being about four chapters long. Jonah was a prophet of God in, in the nation of Israel. He mainly ministered in Judah. God gave Jonah a very direct command. He told Jonah to go to Nineveh with one message, and we find that message yeah, and that message was this, Ye, yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be destroyed. I mean, shall be overthrown. That sounds on a free forward. That was the message at the beginning of Jonah 1 that God sent Jonah to tell. That God sent Jonah to tell. Go and tell them they're about to be. But according to Jonah uh, 1 and 3, Jonah rose up and fled from the presence of the Lord. Now I'm going to look at these verses right here. I'm, I'm going to read some verses. And I'm going to consider these verses as I read. Jonah 1 4 says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there, there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was likely to be broken. Jonah one seventeen. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah in Jonah two ten. And Jonah the Lord and the Lord spake unto the unto the fish. And it vomited Jonah out upon the dry ground that day after Jonah had confessed and repented. Jonah 4 6. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and, and made it to come up. Oh, let me back up here just a minute. Jonah in Jonah chapter 3, he has went to Nineveh, he has begun to preach to that nation. He has told them that in 40 days they're going to be overthrown. 
in 40 days they're going to be destroyed. He finally obeyed God, but, but Jonah is still not a happy man. He has went and he has begun to, to tell them that God was going to overthrow them. That was the only message. No message of repentance, no message of nothing. But he went and as he went through and began to preach to them, an amazing thing happened that Jonah wasn't expecting. That was the, well, he might have been, well, he was expecting it because he, this is the reason he didn't want to go. Nineveh repented. Nineveh got a heart right with God. That whole nation, the king had a whole nation begin to cry out to God. And God changed his mind about destroying Nineveh. Somebody one time said God don't ever change his mind. God changed his mind about destroying Nineveh. And because of the people's true heart for true repentance, God spared destruction on Nineveh. However, Jonah got angry with the Lord. I mean, he, he did not like this. You see, Jonah was from Israel. They hated the, 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 uh, in the other nation, in the other Gentile nation. And so he really wanted to see Nineveh destroyed. But he knew that God was patient. And really, in Jonah chapter 4, near the beginning, Jonah, God even asked Jonah, and this is my boat, and God even asked Jonah, said, what's wrong with you? And Jonah said, this is the reason I didn't want to go in the first place, because I knew that you were a loving God, a forgiving God, a compassionate God. This is the reason I didn't want to go. But I want you to listen to these other verses. Jonah 4, 6, and the Lord God pre prepared a gourd. Jonah has went up into a hill, and he has built him a little booth to see what's going to happen in Nineveh. He said the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up for Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd, verse 7, but God prepared, God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smoked the gourd that it withered, verse 8. And it came to pass when the sun had risen that God prepared a vehement east wind. And there, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that, that he fainted and wished that he himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. We must understand something here. Have you noticed something in these passages? Have you noticed the words God sent and God prepared? In these passages we see what well, God indeed sent and God prepared. Nowhere in the book of Jonah, now stay with me, nowhere in the book of Jonah do you read of any action on the devil's part. Jonah was being disobedient to God. He had, God had given him a command to go and he had rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord. He did not, for whatever reason, he did not want to obey that simple command. And because of that, he wrote, he refused to go. Let me let me tell you something. Disobedience will always cause us to flee from the presence of God. Disobedience will always cause us to flee from the presence of God. Now I believe that's why some people just refuse to go to church. Whoops! Did I say that? <laughs> That's why some people do, because they want to run from the presence of God. Or they make excuse after excuse about why they really don't go, but it's because they've got something, God has told them to do something, and they refuse to do it. It might not even be to go preach. 
It might be the play for those that have hurt. It might be a mess. It might be that God wants you to forgive someone and in your heart you just refuse to forgive because you're so angry. It might be for any reason, but friend, I want you to know God, what I'm trying to get the message here today is this. Sometimes the storms that you and I are facing in life, it's not from the devil. Many times it could be the Lord disciplining us. You know, today's Father's Day. I'm thankful for my daddy. My daddy, you know, we talked um, in, in Sunday school today about God is good. And he uh, gives good gifts and stuff. But there's another side to God, too, we forget about. I'm thankful for my daddy. I'm named after my daddy. I, I'm glad to be named after him. I love my daddy. I've got great respect for my daddy. And see, my daddy was a true father. Because he didn't just step back and when I done something wrong, just go, well, he's got, he's disabled, you know, he will, he don't know anybody, no, no, he, no. he didn't do that. When I got out of line, I, got, I had the word of, of correction applied to my rump. I had the board of education applied to the seat of knowledge. I didn't like it at the time, but you know something? I'm glad that he did. It's a big reason why I turned out the way I have. And I don't think I've turned out to be bad. I'm sorry, Dr. Spark is wrong. All these others that say don't whip your kids, they're wrong. To me, it, 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 the Bible even teaches if you don't discipline your children, and I don't mean beat them, but if you don't discipline your children, the Bible says you don't love them. And I thank God, my daddy and my mother both, but my daddy loved me enough to discipline me when I was wrong. God loves you and I enough that when we get out of line, he disciplines us. Sometimes it may come in the form of financial discipline. Sometimes it may come with sickness. Sometimes it may come in ways that we don't understand. But you see, there were two hard lessons that we must learn from the book of Jonah. Number one, God does send storms at times. And really and truly, for and ultimately, even in the book of Job, God was still always in control. But we must realize sometimes before we get all caught up rebuking the devil, we may need to step back and see who the real Excuse me, who the real one is to sin it. Number two, God through the storms in the life of a Christian, in the life of to chastise those who are disobedient and rebellious to his command. In the book of Hebrews, chapter In the book of Hebrews, I may have didn't put it in this thing, but in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, it tells us, yes I did, Hebrews 12 and 5, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastising of the Lord, nor faint when he when thou art rebuked of him. For whom, listen to this, for whom the Lord loveth. Everybody, oh God, the God of love, he won't send any faint bad. For whom the Lord loveth, he chastises and scourges every son whom he receives. My message is simply this today. We get so caught up in the storm. Maybe sometimes we need to step back 
and examine ourselves and see if this storm is really the result of God's discipline. Because God may very well be trying to get our attention. So once, so how should we respond when a storm comes and things go wrong? Many times we'll already know if we've got sin in our life and if we do, we do need to repent. We need to ask God for forgiveness. And only then do we receive. But we need to ask, stop and ask our Heavenly Father to search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there'll be any wicked way in me. Lead me not, uh, lead me in the way of everlasting, and that's found in Psalms 139, 23 through 24. If you are sincere with God, He will show you. And friend, when He shows you, then we need to repent, get it right with the Heavenly Father. Don't just step back and say that the storm is there because of a uh, 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 of the devil, it could be, but more than likely it may be that God is trying his best to get your attention. One of my former pastors always said it this way. He said there were some people that can never get out of storm after storm because God loves them so much. That he knows if they ever fully removed the storms from their life, that they will forsake him. Maybe the reason you're going through some of the storms today is because you keep holding on to things you need to let go. Maybe that storm today could be God pricking your heart and saying, I need to listen up, son. I need to listen up, daughter. I'm trying to get your, your, your attention here. There's something in your life that is hindering fellowship here. Don't despise the correction of the Lord. Don't rebuke the devil and think it's just automatically from the devil. But ask God to search. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that the world is blessed. I thank you that, God, there is nothing too hard, nothing impossible for you. Father, I ask that, Lord, that this message will put the hearts of those that you have, you have to hear it. God, if we need it, we would all pray, Lord, sort our hearts, sort us and know our hearts, and see if there be any wicked way in us. Let the spotlight of the Holy Spirit shine heavily upon us, that we might sort our hearts and see if there be sin, if there be wickedness within us. Father, that we might get it out of the way and that we might repent and walk in a newness of fellowship with you. Father, I thank you for it right now in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name. Now, friend, I, I'm going to pray for you. If there, if we we take prayer requests. If you have a prayer request, send it. But I want to pray with you right now. There are many who are falling down with problems, trials, situations going on, and I do challenge you, search your heart, see if it might be the Lord trying to get your attention. But I'm going to pray that God will stretch forth his healing hand. There is so much sickness going on today. Father, I just lift my hand up right now. And Father, as I stretch forth my hand, God, I ask that, Father, you touch those that are sick and Father. Father, that you would minister to them by your power, by your word. Father, that you would stretch forth thy hand to heal, deliver, set free, minister by thy divine power. Father, I speak the Father my altar to be gone in Jesus' name. I cause cancer to be gone in Jesus' name. Father, I speak the heart conditions to be healed. I speak the blind eyes to be opened, their fears to be unstopped. Father, I speak to the lame to begin to walk. 
Father, I speak that every known affliction to be gone and to be healed in the name of Jesus. For, Father, you said in thy word that you sent your word and you healed and delivered them. And, Father, we stand on that promise even now. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. May God richly bless you share this video. It's always good to come to you live. Always good to enjoy a beautiful day as this with you. Just a gorgeous day. Just a gorgeous day. May God richly bless you is our prayer. And if we can pray with you, send us a prayer request. Share this video. God bless.